With our current AG sort of on a milk carton, we have a guy who says he wants to be the AG. And this is not the first time we've talked to State Senator Dawson Hodgson about that, but uh, he's been pretty vocal on this 38 Studio stuff, which really kind of elevated last week when Tim White did an incredible job. Actually, I told you yet last week that somebody actually said uh, the Tim White's doing a great job as AG. Who said that? It was uh, John Laughlin, the former state representative who was filling in for me on the radio last week. But uh, we'll have uh, Dawson in here, and he can talk to us about the latest developments. So let's move along. It's Monday. Good evening. Great to have you in. Thank you for joining my state of mind. I am Dan York, and here are some of my thoughts on the rundown. Yeah, there's a lot of rhetorical momentum here, but I don't know what we're actually going to be able to do in Nigeria. So we have our first gay football player in the National Football League. Maybe. This is an interesting stat that kind of was subtly put into an article in the Providence Journal this weekend on migration. We'll talk about what the radio audience thought about that. The NBA owner is looking for another chance. And, you know, there are a lot of people who think that Montreal was a favorite to win the Stanley Cup. <clears throat> I'm not so sure that's the case. Let us dig in and see if we can extrapolate a little bit and share some thoughts. Yeah, this bring back momentum is, is, is interesting, right? So here's the Washington Post headline. First lady calls for return of Nigerian girls. And, yeah, it, it, here's a little bit from Fox News on this. The first lady used the president's weekly address to talk about the kidnapping. And I want you to know that Barack has directed our government to do everything possible to support the Nigerian government's efforts to find these girls and bring them home. That's actually CBS, but uh, we get stuff from both places. Look, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that the first lady is, is weighing in here. Uh, Barack... I always get uncomfortable when she refers to the president by first name, but she is married to him. But what do they mean by what they're going to be able to do? I mean, these knuckleheads have, have taken these poor young girls and already declared them having moved to Islam. What, in a couple of weeks? Nice job, guys. And now they're ready to trade them back into their former places if they can get some prisoners in exchange. It's a lot of nonsense going on. Martha Raddatz at ABC ask the Secretary of Defense about what you can really do here. We're going to uh, bring uh, to bear every asset we can possibly use to help the Nigerian government. I, I know one of the things people keep saying is why wouldn't U.S. special operators go in and try to find the girls? Yeah, well, I think you look at everything, uh, but, but there's no intention uh, at this point to be uh, putting any American boots uh, on the ground. What does, that, what does that mean? You look at everything, but we're not going to use any kind of force. You know what you got to do? You're going to have to pray on this one. It is an awful, awful story. I understand, but the Nigerian government's going to have to figure this thing out for itself, for the most part, it seems, because while we huff and puff and, you know, hashtag bring back the girls, we're not threatening to do anything. Anyway, stay tuned. Think good thoughts, but I'm completely confused. I think a lot of Americans are. Next item here, uh, breaking through. I, I put this up on our rundown because it's, it's such a, a pivotal time, right, when it comes to equity and orientation and all of that. WallStreetJournal.com headline here, 249 picks later, Michael Sam gets his chance. This is the uh, college football player, highly touted and out of the closet, right? So... He goes 249 deep, and what I can't figure out, because I haven't spent too much time analyzing it, is whether he's 249 deep because of the gay thing or because they just don't think he's good enough. He's a seventh-round pick for the St. Louis Rams. Here was uh, some of the coverage. The St. Louis Rams select Michael Sam, defensive end, Missouri. Michael Sam is the first openly gay player to be drafted in the NFL. Watching from San Diego, the six foot two, 260 pound All American broke down after learning he was selected. <laughs> yeah, and of course, you know, also, you know, pictures like this had some, you know, gut reaction from some of the players in the NFL. He's kissing his, his uh, uh, fiance, a lover there, whatever. Look, I, I'm not telling you that I'm comfortable with those pictures. I, you know, I'm an old fashioned guy. I, I think I've come a long way, and I think a lot of people have come a long way with uh, the conversation about gay in America today. But I'll tell you one thing, 
that kind of stuff is going to be problematic for him i'm not suggesting he changes it but you know what when it comes to kissing he's going to have to belt a couple of guys in the kisser in order to be able to equitize this whole situation it's going to be very interesting as to how st louis is going to deal with this because you can't you can't be uh, you can't be a token pick in the nfl each roster position is just too valuable and uh, coach fisher there is the kind of guy that's pretty stoned when it comes to this so we'll see uh, those pictures guess what it's evolving america and we have to learn to adjust but defense is defense it's going to be an interesting summer no doubt next item 42 percent said they would if they could i found this fascinating did you see the story in the journal this past sunday i think here's the headline that they were running migration so they're doing this analysis about the population movement there's some data up here that I think is kind of interesting that came out of it. You know, this notion that Rhode Islanders are leaving. Uh, uh, migration by the numbers, Florida, Connecticut. But the number that was really interesting to me, 42% of Rhode Islanders uh, say they would move if they could. So we're the fifth highest percentage of respondents in a Gallup poll that say, you know what, we'd move if we could. So I had a conversation with the radio audience today about that. Really? Or do you just say that? What prevents you from moving? Think about that. The most concrete answers I got from the radio audience on that today, Dan York, weekdays, noon to 3 on WPRO, if you're upside down on your house, if you're upside down on your house, that prevents you from moving. But other than that, maybe a pension ride out, that kind of thing. But everything else is, is stuff that you say you need but you really don't if you really wanted to move. You could move. Oh, well, I gotta take care of my mother. I know, but you could, you could move. My point is this, Rhode Islanders tend to answer these polling questions with the most self-deprecating attitude, right? Uh, if I could get out of here, I would, but I can't, so I don't. Eh, stop talking that way. Truth is, you could go most of you and you don't which is good so be happy and help to change things that you don't like here as opposed to just saying if i could get out of here i'd get out of here does that make any sense to you it made sense to me but that's my state of mind we have your state of mind at the end of the show you can tell me what you think our next item is uh, one more chance. This Don Sterling guy, what the heck is the matter with this guy? The CNN headline on this one tonight, uh, I was baited into a terrible mistake. All right, so the conversation he had with his, I don't know, sort of friend, girlfriend uh, of 50 years, his junior, is what got him all jammed up, all the racial connotations and conversation that he had has the NBA forcing his sale of the team, right? His wife, by the way, wants 50% silent partnership to remain in the team, so it's a very, very financially complicated deal. But he was apologizing to uh, Anderson Cooper on CNN and, and looking for a second chance, and can you give an 80-year-old guy a second chance? And then he finally admitted, you know what? You know, maybe I shouldn't have been hanging around with this, my paraphrase, maybe I should have been hanging around with this 30-year-old girlfriend. Yeah. Gentlemen, guess what? When you play with fire, sometimes you get burned. Because at 80, you're not that sharp in a whole bunch of ways. Hello. And finally. Yep. You know, there are a lot of national pundits in hockey out there who are thinking that Montreal is the Stanley Cup winner. How about a Ranger Bruins series? Wouldn't that be great? I fear that the Rangers might run out of gas. But that's why they drop the puck. What's a better time than May with playoff hockey. I know I've said that before, but I'll say it again. What's a better time than May with playoff hockey? When we come back, he wants to be your AG and a little less political and more tactical about this 38 Studios conversation. Stay with us. So there was a big buzz on 38 Studios last week. Let me just remind you and run the uh, shortened version of the Target 12 presentation by Tim White, and then we'll bring our guest on. Target 12 has obtained a stack of documents that show just how lucrative the 38 Studios deal was set to be for Providence attorney Michael Corso. 
Corso signed this contract in July 2010, just before the company won approval for a $75 million taxpayer-back loan. It was with Kingston Capital, one of his companies, according to state filings. It shows he would get 9.5% of any financing he could secure for 38 studios. Then, in November 2010, another contract, this time under Orb Development, a company in Corso's name, according to state filings. Again, signed by Corso, he's promised 10% of the construction budget for work done at one Empire Plaza in Providence, where 38 studios moved to from Massachusetts. He was to be paid no less than $500,000, according to the contract. Then, in December 2010, yet another contract. It shows he was tapped to identify potential economic incentive programs for 38 Studios. His billing rate, according to the document, $485 an hour. One month later, another agreement. As Target 12 previously reported, Corso was to be paid $300,000 a year to, among several duties, have interactions with government agencies and various public officials. The documents also show Corso's tax credit company, Preservation Credit Fund, was retained to attempt to sell tax credits for 38 studios. In a new development, Target 12 has now confirmed that Corso, Kurt Schilling, and other 38 Studios insiders met in 2011 with Richard Leach, a top aide to Governor Lincoln Chafee, to discuss getting tax credits from the state. Leach tells us he did not tell the governor about the meeting at the time. All right, so that was a really thorough story from uh, Target 12 and Tim White. Dawson Hodgson is with me, the senator. Welcome. Nice Evening, to see Dan. You. Great to be here. Uh, let's make sure everybody knows Dawson is running for uh, the attorney general's position, and of course, the AG is our top law enforcement officer in the state and uh, this conversation becomes a whole lot less p political and a lot more serious not that politics isn't serious because politics makes the democracy run but you know what I mean the tenor of this thing gets a little bit more sure. profound does it not sure the stakes are high and the conduct at issue is something that's of great concern to the people of this state you know this guy Corso who has become somewhat stealth in this whole environment Tim did this great work I mean I've been talking about him the entire time uh, but he's got to come in, he's got to come in it multiple ways and you can see that he, he was taking advantage or saw the opportunities based on funding that Kurt Schilling's company did not get, even with the $75 million that were so haphazardly and ridiculously passed in the General Assembly. So this guy was constantly seeing opportunity. And he even went to Richard Leach, the director of administration, for some tax credit help who didn't tell his boss what a mess this whole thing is. And who can you trust? Dan. The fact that we have this drip, drip, drip of revelations that each one in turn makes us more disgusted with the deal uh, that already had plenty bad uh, to, feel, to feel that way, um, that's why this it lingers. That's why it won't go away. Sunshine's the only disinfectant that's going to clean this from our, our reputation. Um, you, know, you have to rip the Band-Aid off. It's a, a, it, at one point, you, um, you feel like you have to throw up your hands. On the other hand, we have to keep going. As tired as we are of 38 studios, the people deserve both an explanation about what happened and the best decisions going forward. A and the, for the what state. happened is not is not cr it's not spilt milk. The what happened will also explain to people about who really ought to be bearing some of the financial, if not legal, criminal burden in this whole yes. thing. You've got a bill in. Tell me about it. Well, tomorrow the Senate Judiciary, uh, the Senate uh, Finance Committee will be hearing my bill to abolish the practice of issuing moral obligation bonds. As you know, Dan, the moral obligation bond is a unique financial vehicle where the legislature borrows without the consent of the people. Uh, the state constitution uh, requires that for the state to issue debt in excess of $50,000 that the voters approve it. The moral obligation vehicle is um, the tool that the legislature used to, to get bypass. us into the 30, to bypass this, the, the approval of the voters. And it was such so controversial, it's hard to imagine that it would have passed. Um, and then we saw, the obviously, the catastrophic effect of that. We need to take that tool away from a legislature that has shown itself not responsible enough to use it, uh, but by all rights shouldn't have had it in the first place. Um, when I drew this law, it was very difficult to draw a statute that says follow the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution requires the voters' approval. Um, we can't be paying a premium with the people's money for the privilege of going well, around their will. It's, it's really about the instrument itself or the way that, that the, the, the moral obligation bonds were issued based on the loan guarantee that was you know, it was $125 million that mm -hmm. was put up to, to to support small business development, sort of, and the $75 million was in the hopper and nobody knew it. If there, there was more transparency about 
the process. I don't know that you've got to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. Well, it's about both. One is, uh, given our track record with this vehicle and uh, the fact that it contravenes the intent of our governing document, the Constitution, uh, we shouldn't be using it. Um, but the second piece, I think, um, I think is very important when we talk about the consequences of whether we pay or don't pay the 38 Studios obligation. Um, I'd like to pass this bill of abolishing the moral obligation with a declaration of legislative intent that the people of Rhode Island, we pay the bills that are the, of the, any debt approved by the people of the state of Rhode Island. That's a very important principle for us to articulate and reinforce when all of the consequences uh, of a possible non-payment of the 38 Studios bond or a negotiated settlement of that 38 Studios moral obligation come from the state's reputation and the state's um, willingness and ability to pay its debts. Mm -hmm. uh, if we tell the, if we tell the, I believe the only legally justifiable action um, of a rating agency in, in regard to a non-payment of our moral obligation to 38 Studios would be to trash the state of Rhode Island's moral obligation rating. The general obligation, does anybody think the state's not going to pay its bills? Can any financial, um, can any financial professional okay, so translate say that for me that real is quick, a, a, a okay. significant likelihood? So I don't think so. So I, I, I missed this. So, you know, we've got this consultant report that says, you know, we're in deep reputational problems and we're going to get bad ratings if we don't pay this thing. What do you, what do you think is, what, what's the... Well, I think that if, if we had a credit rating agency take a negative action, a punitive action against the state of right. Rhode Island as a result of non-payment, um, I think that the, the, those agencies lack a legal justification for doing so. When these are two distinct bases of so credit. So what do we do about that? So in, in, in addition to being able to say to the rating agencies, moral obligations are no longer available by right. state law, as well as this declaration of legislative intent that we pay all of our general uh, obligations. Um, in, in concert with previous actions we've taken to safeguard the state's credit, like placing the Central Falls bondholders first, um, that track record of defending uh, uh, creditor rights in the marketplace should be more than sufficient to offset any um, negative uh, impact you're that not could come you're from you're the 38 You're not talking about taking action against the rating agencies, though. Uh, it, if they were to take punitive retaliatory action against the state of Rhode Island uh, without legal basis to do so, I think somebody should stand up for the state's rights. Okay. Wow. That's a really deep conversation. I'm going to have to have him on the radio tomorrow to talk more about that. I want to talk about the master lever for a second when we come back. Stay with us. When this bill is passed, and I support it, I don't believe it's appreciably going to change the outcome of, quite frankly, too many elections across the state. Perhaps maybe in another generation or so, but that's only my own personal opinion. That's uh, the State Representative Anthony Corvasi. We call him Doc Vader on the radio program. Uh, we'll have some fun with him. But he was talking about the master lever, which was unanimously passed in the House, and kind of like, what? A good government moment in the House of Representatives. Here was the headline on that. Uh, there it was. And of course, Senator Hodgson's group over there has kind of fumbled this ball, don't you think, on the Senate side? Is this ball going to get picked up and run into the end zone, or what? We are steadfast in our support for abolishing the master lever. I know that Who's a, we? It uh, ain't she. Well, it, my, the big she. We got a big she. There's a picture of the big she. Here's the big she. We got the big she? Yes, that would be the Senate tr uh, president. You have that picture. There she is. She's not too happy with the whole idea. Well, I think there's going to be um, a a consistent and a well-articulated voice from members of the Senate to uh, to move this bill. Uh, my seatmate, Senator Bates, has been putting this bill in for 20 years, and with Speaker Mattiello showing that the legislature can move uh, when it needs to, um, and all the pressure is on the Senate leadership to do this. Um, it's what, an easy. It, what, it's what's an easy. What's saying on the ground? What, what's being said? What, what's the what's the talk? Well, uh, she it, hates it. She wants it to protect the Democratic Party. She says so in public flippantly. Uh, it's it's really tough to say. You know, there there has been one prominent supporter of the master lever on the Senate floor. Um, my colleague Senator Metz delivered a, uh, a rousing speech in support of keeping the lever um, and uh, and and what he felt that it meant to uh, to the community. Um, and there were members of the Senate who stood up and showed their appreciation for that. Um, but it's really difficult to predict. These are, there are some folks uh, on the Democratic side, like Corvasi, who say, come on, let's give it to them. Like, give it to the Republicans. In other words, you know what this is, folks, right? The one line drawn, it's not a lever anymore, it's a magic marker. Democrat or Republican, and everything just falls into place. It's all screwed up. And, 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 uh, but you know what? It'll put Republicans in a, you know what? You asked for it, Toyota, right? In other words, you got it? Let's see what you can mm -hmm. do with it. 
right? That's that's fair to say. They also I, heard I, some Democrats down the ticket, but you know, in small in small races and like that. I think what Representative Corvasi was stating is something that I would agree with that um, that it would take away an excuse, for lack of a better word, for Republican success at the polls. Um, you know, I'm somebody that um, you know believes very strongly that we need a uh, a functional and effective Republican Party here, uh, one that can compete for a majority uh, in my lifetime. Um, but I'm also somebody who doesn't spare them from criticism when it's due, um, and, uh, and I've said often that, you know, I think the Democratic Party uh, has really driven the state into the ground, uh, but I think they bear about 60 percent of the blame. You know, the other 40 percent goes to my party because we don't field a slate of competitive candidates on a consistent basis that can uh, offer a, an attractive alternative to Rhode Islanders. We will get there. We have some people that are worth being excited about. We have ideas that resonate with Rhode Islanders when we can uh, deliver that message you're effectively, have to be careful. and that's something that I do. You're going to have to be careful, and you'll come back a lot uh, running for AG. You're going to have to be a lot less political because it's such an important law enforcement office, right? Tough it, to answer. It is, and you know, that's frankly one of the uh, one of the areas that the people of Rhode Island uh, should be pushing for new leadership in the current Attorney General's office. Uh, you know, the foundation of all the differences between myself and Peter Kim Martin come from our cultural approach. I brought the culture of the Attorney General's office to the legislature. He brought the culture of the legislature to the AG's office. That can't stand. All right. Come on the radio tomorrow. We'll talk more about this concept of the great team. of the uh, moral obligation. Stay with us. Your state of mind next. Here's how you get in touch with the show. Reaction to what you just saw. Give us a call or send us an email or a tweet. We took so much time on some of that stuff that uh, I'm out of time, but I'll get to your state of mind, really, I will, tomorrow. I'll see you on the radio at noon. We'll have Dawson Hodgson in as well. Bye.